Amen. As we said before, we're going to be talking about ministering to the body. Um, and this is a, a, just my portion of the, of the overall teaching on ministering to the family, spirit, soul, and body. If you want to turn somewhere in your Bibles, turn to our anchor scripture. We're going to be coming out of uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. So if you want to you know, get a head start, you can turn there. We'll be there with you shortly. You know, as we talk about ministering to the, to the, the family, um, you, you know, the, the whole of man is, is spirit, its soul, and its body. And, and too often, because the body is what we see, we, we, we think that the body is all that we need to deal with. You know, the members of your family, they consist of spirit, soul, and body. And too often, because the body is what we see and it's what we have to interact with, we think that that's the only thing that we need to address. But when you are only concerned with the body, when your only concern is the body, then what you'll find is that you'll, you'll, you'll find that, 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 that you'll hit and you'll miss. And in fact, you'll become frustrated. And the reason why is because with the body, there's actions. But, but if you only are concerned with the body, then what it is is that you, you begin to lack um, confidence that the things that you intended to do, the things that you intended to happen, that those things are actually going to happen. You, you become fearful. You're like, well, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm taking these actions. But are these actions going to actually produce the results that I'm hoping for? You know, I'm doing these things, I'm doing these things, I'm doing these things. But am I going to get the result that I'm looking for? And you, you, begin, to, you begin to doubt. You're like, well, you know what? I, I did the actions. I, I, I got what I thought that I wanted. But does it make any difference? Does it make any difference? Because when you only look out at the external, what it is is that you, you, you lose sight of, well, what is the motivation behind the external? How do, how, do I, how do I begin to shape? How do I minister? How do I speak to the motivations? And, and when you only look at motivations, and, and you know that, that's called rewards and punishments, when you only look at, at the motivations, then you, you begin to, to lose sight of, well, what is the actual, what's the, the direction? What's the, what's the focus? And so you have to, to, to speak to your family. You have to consider your family at, at, in its entirety, spirit, soul, and body. In these last weeks, we've been talking about, um, you know, the role of the Holy Spirit in the family. And when you look at scriptures, you see that the, that the Holy Spirit is given to us, that Christ said that he was going to send the Holy Spirit so in order to lead. The role of the Holy Spirit in the family, it, it's to lead. The Holy Spirit, it sets the direction, it sets the, the, the focus for the family to increase in the knowledge and understanding of their salvation. The Holy Spirit, it's, it's active in, in the teacher to speak a word in season. The Holy Spirit also acts in the, in the hearer to be able to receive the word and to bring forth acceptable fruit. When we look at the, the, the soul in the family, the role of the soul in the family, well, what, is the, what does the soul do? We, we see when we talk about the soul, we're talking about the seat of your emotions. We're talking about how you value, how you rationalize. We're talking about your, your motivations. And so the, the soul, what it does, it, it, it weighs and it considers. You know, the, the soul, it, 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 it's an interesting aspect of, of, um, of, the, of, the man, of man because the soul, what it does is it exists to process information. You know, a lot of people say, well, you can have a good soul or you can have a bad soul. Actually, the soul is, the soul is neutral. The, all the soul is doing is, is it's, it's taking in information. And what it does is it takes in the information that's provided to it. 
either from the spirit or from the body. And what it does is the soul's purpose is it proposes solutions. The soul weighs and considers and says, well, you know, we can do this. You know, we can, we can, we can do that. Well, why don't we try this way? The, the solutions that, that are proposed by the soul, they're only good as the information that's provided. They're only good as the information that's provided. And we said in, in the teachings before about the soul is that the, the solution, the solution that our souls are looking for, they're found in the word of God. The solution that our souls are looking for, they're found in the word of God. And your family needs to hear, they need to understand, and they need to be able to apply the word of God in every situation. And when we're talking about this, we say that your family needs to, I wanna, I wanna rephrase that, your family needs to develop the ability to, here. They need to develop the ability to understand. They need to develop the ability to apply the word of God in every situation. It's not going to be something that, that happens, you know, like a light switch. It, it's not something that happens at the moment of conversion. This is a process. This takes careful leading and directing. This takes attentiveness. This takes paying careful attention to the teaching and making application. And, and you know what, just because you get it right one time, that doesn't mean that you have it down. It takes constant practice and application. And Minister Haston, before me, he, uh, he, talked, he started talking about the role of the body in the family. And we think about the body. The body is where we see our actions. That's what the body does. The way that we know that we are alive, that we are animated, is that we act, is that we move. The body is an expression of what's going on in the spirit. It's an expression of, of what's going on in the soul. And we said that the body is it, for the Lord. The body is for the Lord. And as your family needs to present themselves as, as a, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And so in looking at the body, we said that, that the body, its, its purpose is, is, is to act. And that the body is, is for the Lord. But one of the things that I want you to understand is that, yes, your, your, your body, it's, it's for the Lord. You are to present yourself to the Lord. But the only way that you can do that, and our pastor pointed it out, he says the only difference between who you are now and who you were before is because of the grace and mercy of God. It's because of his mercy that he, he delayed judgment until you could hear. It's because of his grace. When you could not, he could. When you were weak, he was strong. And so, yes, the body is for the Lord, but also know that God, he's for your body. God is for you. He is on your side. He is not working against you. And so in Philippians chapter four, verse starting with verse six, it says, be anxious. I'm going to just read from the New King James. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The scripture says, be anxious for nothing. So listen, the title of my, of my message is ministering to the body. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Too often we, we, uh, we allow ourselves to become 
weighed down, weighed down with the, the, the current circumstances, with the way that things appear, with, the, with what we can see in terms of the direction where things are headed. We, we, we sometimes doubt it as to whether the work that we're putting in, if it's going to actually pay off. Or we're concerned because we see things that are happening now that are upsetting and disturbing a piece of our home. And so in this teaching, what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to have you to address it from the inside out. And we talked about the spirit and we talked about the soul. Now we're talking about the body, the manifestation. And this is where we see the anxiousness. And when we're talking about anxious, there, there are three things that I want you all to take away, three objectives for this message. Is we want you to, 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 to begin to seek the Lord in all things. To begin to seek the Lord. You say, well, brother, I do seek God. I'm, I'm praying all the time. No, we're saying actually seek the Lord in all things. We want you to develop confidence in what God will do. We want you to develop confidence in what God will do. And we're going to talk about we're going we're gonna to be mature in this discussion. We're going to talk about the things that God will do that only God can do. That you can't expect anybody else to do. If God doesn't do it, it won't be done. These are things that God will do himself. And we're also going to talk about the things that God will do as he's working through others. There are some things where God, he's not going to supernaturally manifest that thing, but he's going to work through others to have his will accomplished. We're gonna, our objective is for, for you to begin to seek wisdom. For you to, to, to look for strength and mercy according to the role that God has given each member of the family. So three objectives is to begin to seek the Lord in all things, to begin to de develop confidence in what God will do, and to begin to seek wisdom, strength, and mercy according to the role that God has given each member of the family. And so when we talk about, as we dig into this, it says, be anxious for nothing. When we talk about anxiety, what is that? Anxiety is it's an uneasiness of mind. When we're anxious, our minds are not settled. And what happens is that it, it robs your focus. Anxiety is an uneasiness of mind when you should be focused on the main thing you're looking at things that are on the peripheral. You're looking at things that, that are outside of your control. You're looking at things that, that, that are not for you to deal with. You lose focus. Anxiety, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brooding fear. A brooding fear. You know, when I think about that word brooding, what, I, what I'm talking about, it's, it's a fear that, that just hovers. That just, that just hovers. It, it, it smothers. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's enveloping. And what this fear does is that it causes hesitation when action is needed. Anxiety, it's, it's a brooding fear. You can't quite place your finger on it, but you know that there's something that's not quite, you know, you, 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 you're, you're afraid. And, and when you should be going forth boldly to do what God has called you to do, to respond and to answer, you're saying, I gotta, I gotta pray on that some more. I gotta think about that some more. 
maybe, you know what? I, I keep, you know, my parents keep telling me to do this, but I just need to, I, I know I need to do this for my family, but if I could only get these things right first, uh, you know, I know what my husband needs. I know what he wants. But if, if I could just get to this, this, other, this other thing out of the way. It's, it's, it's a brooding fear. It says, if I become vulnerable, what's going to happen? If I, if I open up, if I expose myself, If I, if I take my guard down, am I going to be hurt? Am I going to be hurt again? Am I going to be disappointed? Am I going to be disappointed again? You know what? Anxiety, what it does is it puts doubt in your mind about the result. It puts doubt in your mind about the result. And when you have doubt in your mind about the result, you hold back in your effort. You say, you, you know, I'm going to try it. I am trying it. I'm going to try it. But you, in your mind, you're thinking, well, what if I fail? What if I fail again? What if I ask and the answer is no. What if I put myself out there and I expose myself and I let myself be seen and I'm rejected? Anxiety, it takes away your focus. It's, it, it's, it's a brooding fear and it brings doubt in your mind about the results. So what we're, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get you to, to pray according to the will of God, knowing what God will do and knowing what God has done. We're trying to get your focus off of you and how you can fix it. We're trying to get your focus off of your spouse and what they need to do in order for the house to function correctly. We're trying to get your focus away from your children and how they are behaving right now. We're trying to get you to go to the source of your strength, to go to the source of your power. and to begin to pray according to the will of God, knowing what God will do and what God has done. You know, when we look at this, there's, there's, there's some common mistakes or some missteps, you know, that, that we find in the family. First of all, when we, when we look at husbands and wives, we see that, that, that one spouse is looking for the other spouse to provide something that only God can provide. We, we see that, that a spouse is looking for, for, for validation. They're, 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 they're trying to find peace. They're trying to find things that only God can provide, a, a satisfaction, things that only God can provide. Also, when we look at spouses in the house, we see that one spouse is, is, is earnest, is, is so earnest, and they themselves want to do for their spouse what only God can do. Just, you know, just, just some, some, some examples. You, you find wives that are trying to, to prop up their husband's ego. To, to keep him, keep him, keep his spirits high. They feel like it's their responsibility that he's not happy. They're, it's their responsibility that he's not content. If I could just be the person that he wants me to be, if I could just make the house the way that he wants it, 
then he'll be pleased with me. I'm reminded of how Leah was, 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 was so earnest to, to win the, the, the love of her husband, Jacob, that, that she had these, these children. And, and she was having boy children which were desired. And she, she had one child and, and, it, and it just didn't seem like, like, like Jacob's affections were turned towards her. And she had, had the other child, so she had two childs two children and his affections were still not turned towards her and finally in her third child she named him Judah and she said I'm going to praise the Lord because she knew that for all her efforts that there were things in, in Jacob's life that she could not provide that he could only get from God Just some, some, some natural examples is we, we see that, you know, one, one spouse will try to keep the other, his, 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 the other one isolated. They'll try to keep them isolated, cut off from their family, cut off from friends. You know, can we go out and socialize? Can we go out and, you know, do this dinner with this? Uh, no, I, I don't want to know. No, I just, want to, I just want it to be us. I just want it to be us. You're, you're all I need. My eyes are satisfied with only you. No, no, we don't, we don't, we don't. No, I don't want to have anybody coming over because, you know, I just want it to be us. I just want it to be us. They, 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 they're, they're isolating it's the isolation game. It's the isolation game. And when you when you become isolated, then you become dependent. You know, I can't I can't go to any anybody else for I can't for counsel, for help, for support. Anything that I need, I need to come through you. We talk about husbands. They 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 try to make their wives ashamed of their femininity, right? I don't know if you should wear that. You sure that, you know, that, 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 that lipstick, I'm not quite, uh, I don't know. You know, you, you're telling her that you don't like the red lipstick on her, but all the other women that you're looking at and you're commenting on, you like the way their lips look. You don't want her to wear that dress, but all the other women, you're like, ooh, that dress is hitting her just, you know. You're trying to make her ashamed of her femininity. What, what, what it is is that you're, you're trying to rob her of her self-expression. You're saying, you know, I don't know about those shoes. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know about that hairstyle. What does that have to do with you? What does that have to do with her role in the home? If you wanted someone that was just like you, you should have got married to your reflection. And, if, and, and to be honest with you, if you wanted to marry somebody like you, brother, I'm concerned. Because that's an abomination according to scripture. Man was made for woman woman was made for man. You try to, to take away her, her femininity. The, another thing that husbands do is that they, they become inconsistent with the direction of the home. Yeah, you know, one day we're going this way and then another day we're going that way. They become inconsistent with the direction of the home. They say, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to do this thing and be disciplined in this area. And the first one to break discipline is the husband. They're like, well, wait a second. I thought we were going to be disciplined. And go for, oh, well, yeah, you know. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, allow and permit these, these other things. And then the next thing you know, as soon as, as there's, there's a, 
enjoyment or there's some regularity. No, we're not, we're not doing that anymore. You become inconsistent with the direction that's set for the home. You know, we see it in wives also. They, they try to rob the man of his masculinity. They try to rob the man of his masculinity. You know, it's, just, it's little small things. You know what? Just, just, just give it to me. I can, I can do that. Just no, just, just no. Just, just, just back away and let me take care of it, cause I know how to do it. I know how to do it better. Just, just step back. Or, really? I can't, I can't believe you. You know, I can't believe you did that. You bought what? Why do you think we need that? Where am I supposed to put that? I mean, where? Where am I supposed to put that? They try to rob the husband of his masculinity. He says that we're going to go in this direction and immediately begin to scheme and think, well, how can I make him see that that's not the direction that we need to go? How can I make him see how that's wrong? Oh, I, I, I know, I know, I know. I'm tired tonight. No, I'm not, I'm not, no, no. You just stay over there. You stay there. Maybe it'd be better if you slept in the living room. Why? What's wrong? You know, that thing that you said three weeks ago? I just can't believe you said that. I can't, I can't believe you said that. You know, that, that's one extreme. And I said the other extreme is where wives, they try to, to prop up their husband's ego. And where, they, where they'll, they'll follow them willingly into any kind of behavior, any kind of ungodly behavior. Let's look at some biblical examples. Go to 1 Kings. In 1 Kings, it's talking about Ahab, who's a, a, a king over, over Israel. He's a, he's, he's a wicked king. He's a, he's a weak brother. And he's got the perfect wife for his destruction. Her name is Jezebel. Now, to set this up, Ahab is desiring to purchase a vineyard from one of his neighbors. And so Ahab, he's the king, but the king can't just take what he wants. I mean, there, there, there has to be some rule of law. And so Ahab goes to his neighbor and he says, you know, if, if, you'll, if you'll just give it to me, I'll give you money, I'll, I'll even swap the vineyard, I'll give you another vineyard someplace else, but I just want this one. And the neighbor says, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm not ready to sell this. This, this has more meaning for me than it will ever have for you. And, you know, I'm, I'm always, uh, when, I, when I read about Ahab, I'm reminded of, um, what do you call it, a, not even an, an adolescent, I'm reminded of a small child. That when they can't get their way, what do they do? They stick their lip out and they begin to pout. You probably saw that the last time you couldn't get your own way in the house. You began to stick your lip out and began to pout. So 1 Kings chapter 21, just read it, verse 7, it says, And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. She says, Don't you know who you are? She's pumping him up, pumping him up. Go ahead and eat, eat, eat bread and be merry. Stop, stop pouting. I'm going to get it for you. I'm going to get it for you. And so she begins to set up lies and deceptions and false witnesses so that that man is, is king. So that, that man, so that the man Naboth is, is, is killed. And then jump down to verse 14. It says, Then sent 
Jezebel saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. Instead of rebuking her, and chastising her for this abominable thing that's been done. He says, well, well, thank you, honey. He goes off and he takes possession of the vineyard. Ahab, he needed to be content. He was already the king. He already had vineyards. He needed to be content in what he had. But instead, he allowed himself to be manipulated. And Jezebel, she, she needed to, to bring forth the word of God to her husband. But what did she do? She says, well, you know what? If you can't get what you want, I can get it. That's, that, is, that is what happens when we began to, to do things out of order. We want to take, the pla take God's place. We say, you know what? If God won't do it, I'll do it. If, if, if God won't make it happen, I'll make it happen. You know, I used to have a, there, there, when, I, when I was younger, there, were, there was a saying in business. And, you know, when you're young, you, you, you hear all kinds of things, but it, it was, if it is to be, it's up to me. Right? If it is to be, it's up to me. And I didn't realize until much later how wrong that is. If it is to be, then it already was, and it was spoken by God. Read Ecclesiastes if you need some more insight into that. If it is to be, guess what? It already was, and it was already spoken by God. So when we look at, 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 at these, these errors, where men try to take the place of God, they try to take his, his sovereign position, his rightful place. We see these, these um, also with, with, with parents. And we see that, that parents, that they, they, they begin to place their children in areas where they can find favor on, on a, on a athletic field, sometimes in, in the classroom, sometimes they say, well, you can find favor, you know, in your career or on the job. When they should be guiding their children to be about the father's business, to be about the father's business. And you know where I'm going. Go to Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two. This is where, where Jesus and his parents, they are in Jerusalem for, for the festivals and, and, and they are now heading back home. But as, they, as they're going back home, they, they journeyed a couple of days and, or three days and, and, and now that they, they see that, that Jesus is not with the group. And so they go back to Jerusalem to find him. And where do they find him? They find him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. I'm in Luke chapter two. I'm at verse 46. And it came to pass after three days, they found him in a temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. The doctors at that time, these are not medical physicians. These are, these are the teachers. Both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, these are his parents, Mary and Joseph, when they saw him, they were amazed. 
And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. In verse 49, it says, And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? He, he's saying, How did you look for me? I understand that you were looking for me. How did you look for me? What, what, I, what I love that is that he doesn't say, Where did you look for me? He says, how did you look for me? What did you expect my motivations to be? See, when you say where, that just speaks to a place. But when you say how, how speaks to what did you think my desire was? How did you look for me? What did you think that I valued, that I considered most important? Where did you think I would find safety? What did you think that, that I would be the most benefit to the kingdom? What did you think that I would consider precious? He asked them, how is it that ye sought me? And he says, wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. And so parents, we have to, to stop putting the motivations in our children that, that the most precious thing, the most valuable thing is for them to attend to the body. For them to satisfy the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. To, 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 to keep, to get that paper, to, to get those stacks, to make money, make money, make money. We have to, to turn our children away from finding their self-worth and from finding their value and how others perceive them. We have to turn them to, to being about the father's business. When Minister Martin and I, when, when we were much, much younger and we were um, I don't know if we had children or were thinking about, you know, the prospect of having children. You know, one of the things that, that we talked about was, uh, was how our children would work when they were in their teenage years and when they were still in our homes. The kind of, of, of work and the kind of jobs that, 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 that we would guide them to. And I know it seems kind of strange, right, that, that, that 20 year olds would be talking about how their children would be working 20 years from then. That's just the kind of people, you know. That's just the kind of people that we were. Hey, that's that Brother Martin, Minister Martin, that's the kind of man that he is. He kind of leads these conversations. And we said that, well, when I look at the jobs, we said when we look at the jobs that we had, that we had done, and, and the things that, that had, we had occupied ourselves and kept ourselves busy with, we said, well, you know what? Some of those things were not actually beneficial to our development as men, to our development as students. They, they had no purpose in our lives. We said that, you know what? I'm not gonna have my children working at these particular places because that's not, that doesn't really help them in any way. And I remember I said, well, you know, brother, if, if anything, if, if my son needs money, I just have him come cut your grass. I said, because if anything, if he, if he needs money, I know that he's safe working with you. But even then, we were saying, you know, we're, there, there, there are too many times when we have our children becoming busy and becoming occupied with, with foolishness, being around people that are not a godly influence in their lives. I remember it was when I started working, I think as a, as a 14 year old, that I found out what peppermint schnapps was. That's not something a 14 year old needs to know. I was at another place and I was like, okay, why are all the guys volunteering to take out the trash? And I found out that it's because when you take out the trash, there's a, there's, there's a six pack 
over there, not, I guess it wasn't a six pack, it was a case out there by the trash can. And so of course they all wanted to take out the trash so they could take down the pop. We have our children becoming occupied and so focused on external success, on cashing paychecks and making grades, but they're not about the father's business. They're not about the father's business. Listen, in Exodus 32 verse 1, you'll see what happens when you begin to, to put something in the place where God should be. The people became impatient because Moses was on a mountain with God and he, he, he delayed in coming back. And they went to Aaron, the priest, and says, you know what? Make us a God. Make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. We don't know what's become of Moses. They said, make us gods. And how is it that a God that you make can go before you? It, the God was made by your hands, and so it's, de it's, it's definitely after you. If it was made by your hands, then how can it save you? Because the need for salvation means that I can't save myself. So how is it that something that I make is able to save me? But we allow ourselves to become delusional. We become foolish, having begun in faith, having begun in the spirit that now we are in the flesh, and we make unto ourselves idols. We make unto ourselves idols. We, we make our husbands our idols. We make our wives our idols. We make our children our idols. Listen, my child doesn't need to buy me a house. My child is not my retirement plan. They are the Lord's heritage. So how, how do we avoid this idolatry? How do we avoid this idolatry? The reason why the people sought to make idols is because they had lost confidence in their God. They had lost confidence in their God. And so we need to continue and to develop and build in our confidence in what God will do. And there are very specific things that God will do he says it in his word that he will do. In order to avoid idolatry, we need to develop confidence in what God will do. Amen?